If you enjoy the topics and videos you see here on Power of Thought, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. It would really help to support us. Soren Kierkegaard is widely considered to be the father of existentialism, so it's no surprise that he had a lot to say about the individual. His brand of philosophy and religious perspective ran counter to just about everyone in Copenhagen, where he lived and wrote, and really all of Europe at the time. Victorian-era Europe had no room for the isolated and personal relationship with God that Kierkegaard called for. After all, Christianity was woven into just about every level of culture and institutions at the time. Kierkegaard also lived in the shadow of Hegel's widely popular philosophy, one that was adopted wholesale by the intellectual crowd of the time. Being surrounded by so many like-minded people who, to him, had very little true knowledge to give, formed his opinion of the individual versus the masses, the minority versus the majority. For truth always rests with the minority, because the minority is generally formed by those who really have an opinion, while the strength of the majority is illusory, formed by gangs who have no opinion. Kierkegaard emphasized the long and arduous process of developing oneself into a person who can actually form thoughtful opinions, and not simply be mouthpieces for the popular ideas that surrounded them. We see this all around us in popular culture. People consume the latest music, food trends, political opinions, and fitness gimmicks with an insatiable hunger and a short attention span, always dropping one for the other as soon as something new is waved in front of their eyes. Kierkegaard more elegantly communicates this as follows. One can very well eat lettuce before its heart has been formed. Still, the delicate crispness of the heart and its lovely frizz are something altogether different from the leaves. It is the same in the world of the spirit. Being too busy has this result, that an individual very, very rarely is permitted to form a heart. On the other hand, the thinker, the poet, or the religious personality who actually has formed his heart will never be popular, not because he is difficult, but because it demands quiet and prolonged working with oneself and intimate knowledge of oneself, as well as a certain isolation. Not only did he think that such blind consumption without cultivation was a personal tragedy, he thought that it paved the way for some of the most dangerous things in history. Others, like Hannah Arendt, would touch on this same point nicely. In her work, The Banality of Evil, Arendt calls attention to those people who are not individuals, that have subsumed themselves into the crowd, as such unwittingly become vessels for the worst of atrocities, like logistics workers making the train network and schedule meant to carry out Hitler's final solution to run as efficiently as possible. Kierkegaard may have lived far before the horrors of the 20th century, but in passages like this next one, he seems to press on the same important element of standing up as an individual in the crowd. The evolution of the world tends to show the absolute importance of the category of the individual apart from the crowd. But as yet, we have not come very far concretely, though it is recognized in abstract ways. That explains why it still impresses people as prideful and overweening arrogance to speak of the separate individual whereas this precisely is truly human. Each and every one is an individual. But he recognized that for most people, taking on this responsibility can be overwhelming at first. For most people become quite afraid when each is expected to be a separate individual. Thus the matter turns and revolves upon itself. One moment a man is supposed to be arrogant, setting forth his view of the individual, and the next, when the individual is about to carry it out in practice, the idea is found to be much too big, too overwhelming for him. Because of this, most people fall back into the hive mind-like version of opinion, the given opinion of the herd, the opinion that is subject to the rules of conformity, adherence, and obedience. As such, they can never gain access to the truth. They are simply boxed out from it by their own cowardice in the face of having to go their own way and leave behind the security of that crowd. Truth always rests with the minority. The minority is always stronger than the majority, 
because the minority is generally formed by those who really have an opinion, while well, the strength of the majority is illusory, formed by the gangs who have no opinion, and who, therefore, in the next instant, assume its opinion, which then becomes that for the majority, i.e. becomes nonsense by having the whole, the masses, on its side, while truth again reverts to a new minority. In regard to truth, this troublesome monster, the majority, the public, etc., fares in the same way as we say of someone who is traveling to regain his health. He is always one station behind. Kierkegaard, in true religious spirit, saw himself as a martyr in the effort to help the masses to see this reality. He felt that if no one did, man would essentially lead to his own downfall through collective lack of individuality. I will call the attention of the crowd to their own ruination, and if they don't want to see it willingly, I shall make them see it by fair means or foul. Please understand me, or at least do not misunderstand me. I do not intend to beat them. I will force them to beat me. Thus I actually compel them, for if they begin to beat me, they will probably pay attention, and if they kill me, they most definitely will pay attention, and I shall have won an absolute victory. Touching again on the banality of evil, and his belief that people as individuals have good in them, he emphasized the role we play in enabling a crowd of blind followers to continue down this path. Individuals are not so corrupt that they actually wish to do evil, but they are blinded, and don't really know what they are doing. It is all a matter of baiting them for the decisive action. A crowd triumphs if one seeds the way, steps aside so that it never comes to realize what it is doing. A crowd has no essential viewpoint. Therefore, if it happens to kill a man, it is halted. It pays heed and comes to its senses. Like with all of the great tragedies and genocides of history, it often sadly takes the carry-through of evil acts to wake people up as to what they have been a part of. We see this today in our highly divided and politicized culture. We use simplified language, hold opinions given by a few populist and manipulative leaders, and many are willing to commit violence in service of opinions handed to them. Yet if we were to cultivate our hearts as Kierkegaard urges us, we might just be a little more patient, understanding, and receptive to the people and world around us.